Hello, welcome to the Eugenics Podcast. I'm Patrick Merricks. I'm Mario Sturda. In today's topic, we're talking about um, disability and Japan's eugenic protection law. So recently we've seen in the news um, a growing movement in Japan <clears throat> to recognize um, past abuses to um, the population, including forced sterilization and abortion. Marius, what can you tell us about this? It's very in interesting that uh, we are finally hearing more about what's happening in Japan uh, under the uh, eugenic laws and uh, what happened to the victims of eugenic sterilization there. This is one of Japan's best, best kept secrets, I suppose. Um, and now we finally, uh, since 1997, uh, the debate has started, but now we finally hear victims coming forward and the Japanese government agreeing to pay compensation to victims of forced sterilization. So let's look at the history behind this uh, discussion. So um, the Japanese eugenics movement has origins in the um, in Imperial Japan. So um, what sort of movement was this? This is the law that was repealed in 1996, the eugenic protection law, uh, was introduced in 1948, but it actually replaced a, an earlier law that was introduced in 1940, the national eugenics law. Uh, there were two laws introduced in 1940. Uh, one was about eugenics, there was, the other one was about physical fitness. So Japan tried to combine both positive and negative eugenics. They tried to combine both m uh, attempts to improve the quality and the quantity of the population. We're talking about the Second World War, uh, we're talking about the war against China, we're talking about a period when Japan really expanded as an empire. So it was not just about the quality of the population, it was just, wasn't just about fighting degeneration, but it was equally about pronatalism, increasing the number of births, increasing the number of Japanese people. So although they were very concerned with race, and um, uh, as you can see, the association of race hygiene, uh, ultimately it was a combination of both positive and negative eugenics. So uh, race hygiene, was there a connection with the German movement? Because this was a, the, the popular phrase um, over there. It was indeed. And uh, that one of the, the important Japanese eugenicists, Nagai Hisomo, uh, we mentioned he here in the slide, uh, was trained in, in Germany uh, and was very uh, was attuned to developments uh, in Germany and in Europe more broadly. And he adopted a German style um, eugenic um, um, uh, thinking and, and, and practices. In fact, the National Eugenics Law pro promulgated in May 1940 duplicates, uh, to some extent, the Nazi sterilization law of 1933. So German eugenic movement and German racial hygiene movement was quite, um, um, was quite in important to at least this generation of, of Japanese eugenicists. Hmm. So the, um, the law that's being debated today, which had its roots um, in the interwar period and Second World War, passed in 1948. And um, Article 1 stipulates that the law is in place to prevent birth of inferior descendants from the eugenic point of view and to protect life and health of the mother as well. What does this mean? The law was introduced in 1948 at a very important um, moment in Japanese history after the Second World War, Japanese was reduced in size uh, and they confronted the problem of overpopulation. So unwanted pregnancies was something that really uh, the government tried to sort out. It was also a period they were under American occupation. So they uh, they addressed this issue by introducing um, um, this eugenic protection law, replacing the 1940 law. We could see that the, the, the language of interwar eugenics still survives. We have the prevention of, of birth of inferior people. So this is a, a, a way to tackle degeneration. But you have also the other concern, which is the protection of life, uh, of health and mothers. So this is the discussion about abortion uh, that becomes very prominent. And then here we can see what the eugenic protection law actually referred to. It is both about abortion and sterilization. Yeah, so this um, it's quite interesting. There are several different aspects that I'd like you to sort of explain further. So we have the hereditary focus, talking about um, hereditary disease. Um, we also have this reference to the uh, genealogy, but also there are um, 
specifically um, non-hereditary sort of conditions to this um, eugenic law. So um, could you expand on this a bit, please? The law is a clear example of what we may call negative eugenics. It's, a, it's about cleansing the gene pool of the population. So it, it takes a very uh, drastic hereditarian um, perspective onto, uh, uh, onto disease and uh, transmission of disease. So that's one aspect of it. Secondly, when it was introduced, of course, Japan in 1948, Japan was still uh, facing severe economic problems um, and the economic factors and non-hereditary uh, medical factors were considered as important. That, that, that economic reason was later on in the 1970s um, eliminated from the law because by then, of course, there were no economic reasons uh, to, um, to worry about in Japan. So that's one aspect. The other one is, of course, is the focus on disability. So that's very, very powerful because it's the 1940 law is not about disability, whilst the 1948 law, the one that survived until 1996, is about disability. So a lot of people were sterilized because they had various forms of disability. So we've talked briefly about the victims, but let's um, look at some um, specific individuals here. So um, here we have um, Kikuo Kojima, <clears throat> so pictured here in 2018. Now he was sterilized under Japan's eugenic law. Um, this was following a diagnosis of schizophrenia. So what would the rationale be behind carrying out this op operation on um, Kikuo? Kikuo Kojima came forward and told his wife, and then there was a big discussion in 2018 about his case because it happened a long time ago. So he's one of the, the most well-known uh, early victims of this law. He was committed to a psychiatric um, hospital when he was 18, and then he was told by a physician that he suffers from schizophrenia, and then he should not have children. And he was uh, sterilized uh, against his will. And um, it's quite a poignant case. It describes very forcefully what happened to him and how much infliction and pain it suffered. And um, it is something to keep in mind when it, we discuss uh, the story of sterilization. Um, and uh, here's a powerful image of that. So many, many people were um, coerced and even forced into um, undergoing sterilization, not having children at all um, due to this um, eugenic law which was almost half a century that it ran for um, so we have this uh, growing sort of movement moving from individuals to um, to a much bigger thing so what can you tell us about the movement in japan and perhaps even the global movement we we now have a you know a, a more or less clear idea how many victims there were so we know that if under the 1940 law there were over 500 victims of sterilization, under the 1948 law is over 25,000. So uh, we're talking about a number of people who would come forward. Uh, we have some examples here, uh, but more would probably come forward and 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 and, and tell us their stories. So the Japanese government is uh, has agreed to pay compensation. And there is a big debate, not only in Japan, but across the world about the victims of eugenic sterilization. Uh, and that continues. Uh, and it's good that finally we move away from the Euro-American um, discussion and we look at other cases. Um, and Japan is one of the most poignant cases, as you pointed out. It is the longest eugenic law by name in history. That's a very important point, and um, I think it's uh, it's very good that we're um, we're talking about sort of these countries which not necessarily known for uh, for eugenics, and they're not spoken about much in sort of eugenic history sort of so far. But hopefully, we're doing something to correct this. So. Um, I'd like to thank you for joining me today, um, Marius, and also thank everyone for um, for viewing and listening to this. So, um, so once again, thank you, Marius, and um, I'll see you next time. Thank you, Patrick. Until next time.